So, yeah. we are we are glad to be here, and when we're done, we hope we hope that you're glad that we came. Uh -huh. I heard a thing: some people are a blessing wherever they go; other people are a blessing whenever they go. <laughs> and we want to be—that was a joke. We want to be—we want to be the former rather than the latter. But we also want to say that you have been a blessing to us this weekend. The warmth and the sense of unity of this church is remarkable. Honestly, we, we travel quite a bit and we teach at all sorts of churches and what you have here is really rare. I think it's sad that it's rare, but I'm so happy for you that you have this kind of where you're watching over each other. You have a pastor whose sole job is to make sure you're taking care of each other and organizing that and make it actually work in real life. And we just felt that all weekend. So we, you've blessed us. You know, I just, I just thought we should just keep singing who else is worthy until Jesus comes. But we got asked to speak, so sorry about that. But you can hang around for the next gathering because I'm going to get to sing it again. I mean, I felt the presence of God in this place, didn't you? Did you? And he is here, and he wants to speak to you because every time the Bible is open, it's the Word of God. It's God-breathed. It's living. And so God is going to speak to you. Uh, truths that apply to all of us, but also some specific things for just you and where you're at today. Well, you're in a... You're, um, I don't know if you finished it, but you're in a series called Family Matters, and maybe it's it's done now. I'm not sure, but we got invited to kind of be part of that, and I've been listening in to the messages you've been listening to, and it's been beautiful. I've been encouraged myself. I kind of became an online person with uh, Life Center, but uh, Family Matters is all about having Jesus at the center of the family, amen? Mm -hmm. And that's what we need. And I've learned you need three things to have a not just a happy family, but a holy family because holiness is happiness and you want to have a godly family. And I've learned it. You need to have Jesus at the center of your life where you said, I am going to follow him. I'm going to say no to sin and yes to him. And I'm not going to be show up once in a while. I'm going to be all in because God wants all of you so that he can bless all of you. And then secondly, if you're parenting, you need to have Jesus-centered parenting. You need help, right? And he's right there to help you. And you want to have a Jesus-centered marriage. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, in your series, you already heard a beautiful message called The Meaning of Marriage from Pastor Doug. I listened to it. It was beautiful. And he talked a lot about the theology of marriage. There's a lot of deep stuff there. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're married to him. He's, we're the bride of Christ. And to guys, that seems a little weird. But we are the bride of Christ, and Jesus is the bridegroom. And, there's, and every marriage is supposed to show the reality of that to the world. And Doug hit a little bit of that. But today, we want to talk about how some of the biblical truths about marriage, how they play out in everyday life, down where the rubber meets the road. Simply put, what does it take to have a marriage that's not only healthy and holy, but also happy? Because let's face it, there are a lot of unhappily married people. We all know some, and maybe that's where you're at today. And I'm sorry if that's where you're at, but I want you to know that you don't have to stay there. <laughs> because when we're in a mess, we come to the one who solves the mess. And then he takes us as we are, but he loves us too much to let us stay where we are. He takes us into what the Bible calls a fruitful, abundant, joyful life. And we're able to even go through trials with him at the center. And so if you're in a bad place today, your life can change today. Just come and say, I need prayer. I'm hurting, we're hurting, and we need help. And you take one step towards the Lord and he will receive you with open arms and he will begin a work of healing that will surprise you and you will one day say, man, I am glad my life was turned around that day. Everybody wants to live happily ever after. Have you ever met anyone that said, my goal is to live unhappily ever after? Of course not. So some of you are happily married today. Others, maybe you wish you were married. And this is great to hear a marriage, a message on marriage before you get married. And then if one day God brings you to that situation, you'll do it right, right out of the gate. Some of you may be married today and you today, you wish you weren't married. Maybe you got in a fight on the way to church. Isn't that the worst? And then you walk in and somebody says, hi, good morning. You go, how are you? We're fine. <laughs> but you're not fine, you know. And we've all been there. So have we. You know, we had to resolve an issue yesterday. You know, marriage is a relationship, and it takes keeping current. And I, I love a verse in the Bible that I think is very funny. So the Apostle Paul, who God uh, wrote much of the New Testament through, um, 
we believe he was single. And in 1 Corinthians 7, he's arguing for the value of just following Jesus as a single man or a single woman. Because he says, if you're not married, you can have undistracted devotion to the Lord. You can be holy in body, soul, and spirit, and you're, it's just you and Jesus. You don't have the marriage relationship where you need to serve and care for your spouse. But then he said this, which I think is funny. He said, and this is straight out of the Bible, quote, if you've married, you haven't sinned, <laughs> but you will have trouble in this life, and I'm trying to spare you. <laughs> Isn't it true? Because you, you're living with this person 24-7 and God is making you more like Jesus, but you're not there yet, right? Yeah. We won't be exactly like him until we see him face to face. And so this relationship God uses to mold you and refine you and make you into a more beautiful person, more, yeah. more, one that more looks like Jesus. Mm -hmm. But here's, here's the thing that's so beautiful about that is that the Lord is going to do his work and the more we cooperate, the faster it happens. Mm -hmm. Now, before we get going, going, maybe you're here and you say, well, I'm not married, so what did I come today for? Here's the beauty. Marriage is a relationship. And in the family of God, we're all brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers. We're all together. And marriage is a relationship like every other relationship. And in Doug's message on marriage, he said that God created us with a desire for companionship. These three things we want to share with you today that will make for a happily even after marriage also will be uh, good for your friendship. So if you're married, if you're divorced, if you're widowed, if you're single, if you're in middle school, high school, doesn't matter. As you listen to these three things, think of your relationships, the people that you're in relationship with, and the Lord will use them in your life. When Phil and I were first asked to talk about marriage a while ago, I, my first thought that flashed through the, my mind in all honesty was, oh no, <laughs> not that. <laughs> And not with him. <laughs> Only because he knows the truth and so do I that sometimes, lots of times, way too often we struggle and fail at doing marriage gracefully and beautifully. For one thing, I'm an introvert, which means I like to be alone a lot. And I'm married to a raging extrovert, which means he wants us to be together all the time. <laughs> sometimes because he's a man he doesn't and because I'm a woman and I do and we clash but here's the bigger truth we have been married for over 45 years almost 46 mm -hmm. now wait here's the thing to rejoice over and we're happy yeah. we're happy And we love each other. And even though I'm an introvert and he's an extrovert, and even though neither of us is perfect, not even close, nor particularly easy to get along with, and our love has withstood some storms, just like yours, real life stuff. Four children, for one thing. <laughs> Four children who wanted and needed and disobeyed and demanded, just like yours do. Never enough money for another. You don't choose vocational ministry to get rich. And I've rarely had a paycheck, especially when the kids were growing up. Bills piled up and sometimes was really hard juggle to pay them. And we started a church, which is really akin to starting a business together. And the pressure of that certainly brought out at times the worst in each other. And we've known heartache, hard times, hard things. I began to lose my hearing at 26. By 30, I was functionally deaf. Hard. Our son had type 1 diabetes, came down with it when he was 8. That's a terrifying disease, so hard to control. Disappointments that come with real life. And here we are, still in love. No longer infatuated in the same way we were when we met and married. No longer insecure. No longer unsure, after 45 years of real life, we still love each other, and now we are well on our way towards growing old together till death do us part. And so today, what we want to share with you are three things. Three things that when we look back, these three things have made a difference for us. Things that we wanted our kids to understand so that they could also say after 45 years, we are happy. 
things that have created between us a love that has not only lasted, but honestly has grown and flourished. The Lord's actually given us 12 things, but we will not give them to you. You would miss lunch and dinner. All right. We're just going to do three. We've entitled this message Happily Even After. So here we go. If you want to live happily even after, if you're married, or if you want to have healthy relationships, learn to practice love and respect. Practice love and respect. In Ephesians 5, if you turn there, if you have your Bible, uh, we see God's clear instruction to husbands and wives. It's really the go-to passage on marriage for anybody who claims to be a passionate Jesus follower. And we don't have time to go into a lot of the depth, but I want to read the passage and then we want to talk about what it means to practice love and respect in our relationships. Verse 21, Ephesians 5, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I love this. This is the overarching command. Men and women are equal and precious to God, and we are to submit one to another. And then the Lord gets specific. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior which is why we took communion together. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. And then down in the last verse in the chapter, it's kind of a summary statement. Each of you must love his own wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. There you have it, two words, love and respect. Say that with me, love and respect. Notice God commands the husband to love his wife. He does not command the wife to love her husband. Why is that? I don't know. Ask God. Actually, I believe there's a reason. I think women are more naturally selfless. Now, there's exceptions that I'm stereotyping, but they more naturally love, especially when they are loved. The husband is commanded. And there's a deeper issue. If you study marriage, the husband is to be the Christ figure. The woman is the church figure. In other words, the husband is commanded to die for his wife as Christ died for the church. And so we're commanded to do this because we're showing the world. Every marriage is to show the world what this relationship is like between the bride of Christ and Christ as the bridegroom. So the, the husband is commanded to love. Now, we have only one word in English for love. Love. I love my wife, and I love Mexican food. <laughs> they took me to Cactus yesterday. Woo! Oh, man, I want to come back and sing Who Else is Worthy and Go to Cactus. All right. They're, I love them both. But in the Greek language, they had multiple words for love, and the highest level of love was agape love. And the Greek word here is agapeo, and here's what it means. It's the kind of love that God has for you this morning. He has this for you. He loves you unconditionally and sacrificially, expecting nothing in return. Now, we give him everything in return out of hearts of worship. As Tyler led us, we're responding to his love because he loved us perfectly. We want to love him back. But he loves us anyway. It's not I love you if, not I love you because I love you. And this is how God loves us. And the husband is commanded to love his wife the same way, unconditionally and sacrificially. This is what it means. Putting her needs before our own. Literally laying down our life for her. We had the joy of planting a church in Portland, Oregon, and that's where Nike has its world headquarters. So we had a lot of people in our church that worked for Nike. One was an Indonesian couple. Uh, Ito worked for Nike and his, his wife, Adeline. They lived just a couple blocks from the church. They were super involved. Adeline came early. She served all over the church, helping get ready for Sundays like this. So you could walk in, and there was communion, and there were people greeting you, and there were kids workers. She helped. She loved our church, and she loved her home. She was a gardener. She had a gorgeous garden in the back. She had two dogs that she loved. And one day, Ito got called in to work at Nike by his boss, and he said, hey, we're sending you to China for two years, so go tell your wife you're leaving in three months. So he went home, and that was not good news to her. She started to cry. She did not want to go. They had kids that were grown, but in Oregon. She didn't want to leave her kids. She didn't want to leave her dog. She didn't want to leave her garden. She, and so she was very sad about this. But 
this was his job, and, and they knew he was supposed to stay with Nike. So they prepared to go, but she kept having bouts of sorrow. Just before they went to uh, China, Ito's boss calls him in, and he goes, uh, hey, you're leaving next week. I just want to check in. But by the way, how's your wife doing with the move? And he said, well, she's not doing well. She's, she's still crying at times. And he said, oh, that's too bad. He said, listen, when you get over there to China, whatever is your wife's concern, make it your number one concern. And so Ito shared this with me, and I thought, hmm, that guy is either a follower of Jesus who knows how Ito's supposed to treat Adeline, or he's just a smart boss. <laughs> if he gets over there and his marriage falls apart and he's the basket case, he's not going to do a good job. You'd think he would have said, hey, well, just tell her to get over it and get over there and make a bunch of money for Nike, and we'll give you a big fat bonus. But he didn't. He said, make your wife's concern, your number one's concern. And you know what? This is what we're commanded to do, guys. Now, how could we possibly do that consistently? And nobody does it perfectly. Only Jesus loves perfectly. He's always our example. But I learned this. I can only do it through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in me. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I can't make excuses. Well, you've been difficult this week, and I'm tired, and so, you know, get over it. You say, really? Do I have the power to love in this way? Yes. Let me read it to you from 2 Peter chapter 1. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, kindness, patience. These things come from God's Spirit, and then they're lived out through you and me when we surrender to him and say, God, forgive me, God, fill me, God, use me. Then we can actually manifest this kind of love. We won't never do it perfectly. When we blow it, we ask forgiveness. But this kind of love isn't going to just happen. We have to choose to walk with God and we have to ask for his power because we're not robots. We can't do it without him. I like this saying it this way, without him I can't, but without me he won't. Say that with me. Without him I can't, without me he won't. What I mean by that is if I say, you know what, I'm upset with her and I'm just not going to love her this way, God says, well, that's okay because I'm just going to overpower you and love her anyway. No, it's not going to happen. I have to choose to want to love Diane in this way. And as husbands, God doesn't only command us to love our wives. He tells us exactly how in the same passage. It says, he who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it. Another translation says, nourishes and cherishes it. It's a metaphor here to how I am to love Diane. I'm to nourish and cherish her. Nourish is easy. If we have no food to eat, if we don't have a, a roof over our head, ultimately it's my responsibility, so I need to take care of her. And sure, she can help and be part of that, but I'm ultimately responsible. Most guys are pretty good at that. It's the cherishing part that we're not good at. The original language there means tender affection. If your marriage is kind of prickly right now, what your wife really needs is tender affection, kindness. Diana, I've been talking a lot about kindness. She needs to know that you actually care for her and love her. My parents' era had this song, you guys probably won't know it, the first gathering, which is older, they knew it, a song called Try a Little Tenderness. My dad used to play it in our home when I was growing up as a kid. If things aren't going well, try a little tenderness. Now, 1 Peter 3, 7 says that we're to live with our wives in an understanding way. Now, when I read that, then I'm pretty understanding. But then I studied it. <laughs> and here's what it really means. Husbands, you must treat your wives with tenderness, viewing them as feminine partners who deserve to be honored, for they are co-heirs with you of the divine grace of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. That means if I'm not in right relationship with her and I start, Lord, I really want to see you do this. God's saying, well, that's great. I'd like to do that. But right now, your prayer is bouncing off the roof because you need to go treat your wife with tenderness and honor because she's my daughter. And then I'll come listen to your prayers. That's really what that is teaching. And then to get more convicting, guys, <laughs> the word tenderness means with intimate insight. Listen to this. With consideration of what she desires and delights in not being ignorant of her preferences. Wow. Wow. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Your wife can never get enough of you telling her how beautiful she is, how you can't believe she puts up with you and she married you. You can never give her too many gifts. Ladies, can I get an amen? Amen. And 
And my wife told me to tell you this. As your wife gets older, staying beautiful is going to be a little bit of work for her, and it's going to cost you, okay? <laughs> She's a writer, and she wrote this one time, beauty in the mirror costs bucks in the wallet. <laughs> so <laughs> treat her with tenderness and give her the cash. All right. <laughs> if, a, if a wife is nourished and cherished, she will glow. I've trained you well. So. Yes, you have. Yeah. <laughs> Keep it up. I still need it. I still need it. Honestly, I hear men complain about how expensive makeup is and how expensive shoes are, and I think, gosh, if they really saw us every day without those nice things, I think they would gladly cough up the cash. <laughs> Once upon a time, I assure you, a very long time ago, we got in an argument. <laughs> I know that might shock you. Pastors and their wives don't fight, do they? I mean, all that training and talking and generally being called superheroes in the spiritual world, how could they possibly lower themselves to ugliness? We do, and we did. But the possibility of my coming out the victor in a scuffle with a professional communicator has a probability factor of practically nil. And so this day, frustrated with my inability to wrestle him into agreement, because that's what it was about, me wrestling him into agreement, I decided if I couldn't out-talk him, out-argue him, maybe if I wrote it all down, all my frustrations, I could out-list him. <laughs> At first, I decided, I'm a good pastor's wife, I better read my Bible. After all, we know that winning an argument with the preacher requires scripture, lots of scripture. I would come locked and loaded, but this was a Monday morning, and somehow I'd left my Bible amongst all the diaper bags It was that stage of our lives. Uh, I'd left my Bible at church the night before, so I was rummaging around in our bookshelves until I found a different Bible called the Amplified Bible. Anybody heard of the Amplified version? It's really great. And I saw that and I thought, aha, just what I need to amplify my message so he finally hears me. So I sat on the sofa ready to load up on the, all the I'm right and you're wrong verses. And just as I opened my Bible, it was a hardback, had come sort of unglued, a big chunk of pages fell out, spilling God's word quite literally into my lap. And on the front of that chunk was Ephesians 4, 33, and the Amplified Listen. However, let each man of you, without exception, love his wife as being, in a sense, his very own self. There it is. I thought, I just love it when God agrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> I kept reading, though. And let the wife see that she respects and reverences her husband, that she notices him, regards him, honors him, prefers him, venerates and esteems him, that she defers to him, praises him, and loves and admires him exceedingly. <sighs> <sighs> I put my pen down, and I tore up my list, and I got on my knees and cried out to the Father, which is exactly what the Father had been waiting for me to do, just listening as I was ranting and raving and waiting for his daughter to humble herself and get on her knees before him. And this is what God had to teach me that I've carried through the rest of our years of our marriage. He taught me that le this lesson that morning, the, a lesson that would begin to change me and the way I dealt with the differences between us. My husband did not need a list of what he was doing wrong in order to love me in the way that I needed and wanted to be loved. What he needed was a list of what he was doing right in order to be respected in the way that he desperately needed and wanted to be respected. And I have watched this over the years of leading and teaching and counseling and loving women, of being a woman, and I have become convinced that this is the one mystical, beautiful, silver thread thread of sameness that runs through every woman's veins. 
we respect and therefore we love. It's almost like God is trying to tell us something here in his word. Because the truth is when I purpose to notice those things about my husband that make me prefer him, when I regard him through a filter of honor, that's when my chest fills with those feelings of love. And then pay attention to this because your wife's love for you is intangibly tied to her respect for you. Sure, she can practice respect on purpose. That's what the scripture says. But this truth ought to make a difference in the way you live the everyday with your wife. If you're living as a man she can respect, not perfect, but as a man she genuinely admires, she sees you growing, she watches you, you turn away from lust, you guard your eyes. She listens as you fight your pride and you answer your teenager or somebody who's being rude and disrespectful to you with gentleness. She hears you apologize in genuine, heartfelt humility. And she falls in love with you all over again. So that's number one. If you want to live happily even after practice love and respect. Number two, accept each other's differences. Romans 15, 7 talking to the family of God, accept one another, here's how, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. How did Christ accept you? He took you as you are. He accepted you where you are. He loves you where you are. And then he begins to do a work of transforming you into the very image of his son. And we're to accept one another in the family of God and not judge one another. But here's the thing. This word accept in the original language, it also can be translated welcome or be hospitable, welcome one another, be hospitable towards one another. And I wonder what would happen in our marriages if we just started being kind to one another and hospitable towards one another and welcoming one another. I think the whole atmosphere in our marriage would change and our home would change. Instead of, did you do what I asked you to do today? You know, how many times have I told you that? You know, And everybody's defenses go up. Instead of being hospitable and welcoming and loving, man, everything would change. Instead of rudeness, there would be kindness. Instead of judgment, there would be forgiveness. But in marriage, if you want to live happily even after, you have to go a little further than just accepting. You need to appreciate each other's differences. Because... In most marriages, they're very different. Opposites attract, and then opposites attack. <laughs> Why aren't you like me? You know, we tend to see things through our own, our own uh, lens, so to speak. And we think if my spouse was just like me, everything would be great. Maybe it would be smoother, but it'd be absolutely boring, all right? Your spouse is a gift from God to you. Diana's a gift from God to me. And I need to value and treasure her as the Lord treasures her. And you know what? That means she's actually better at some things than I am. And we need to admit that, guys. Our wives fill a ton of holes that are in us. And, you know, this can be difficult at times. When uh, our last of four was out the door and Diane was turning 50, you know, as a guy, you think, well, the kids are gone now. Now it's going to be all about me. <laughs> and she came to me and she said, the Lord's given me two things I know he wants me to do. And I don't have time to tell you what they are, but they had to, had to do with writing. So all of a sudden, she, we had a little, little uh, she shed in the back of our house in Portland area, and she'd go out there and start writing. And she'd get going, man. She didn't even know what time it is. It's like, you know, 4.30, 5 o'clock, and I'm inside. I'm going, like, she's not making any dinner. I wonder if she's making for dinner. I think she's not making dinner, you know. And I thought, she's riding up a storm. And, and, and I was feeling, you know, very sorry for myself. What, what, what's that saying we heard when we were newly married? Women are a bottomless pit of need. Don't stone me. And men are an endless stream of want. Yes. You know? So, like, if you're saying, I need more from you, I need more from you, I want more from you, you're not going to have a healthy marriage. But when I realized that she was a gifted writer and I am to lay down my life for her, that meant that now I, I shouldn't be complaining about her not me. She's an amazing cook, you know, making my favorite meal tonight. I should, I should realize her gifts are my responsibility to help her become everything that God has called her to be. And I needed to not just tolerate or even accept, but appreciate how God's made her. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I think it's all women clapping right now, right? Uh, that was a transformational, transformational, transformative. There it is, transformative 
time in our marriage where I had gone from serving and supporting and doing to Phil letting me transi transition into a ministry that of pouring out to others. And him seeing himself still as the guardian of that gift is just amazing. But in reality, everything about Phil and I are so very different. Our differences are so vast. Me, the introvert, who actually needs lots of time to be alone to think and to study. I love to research. I love to write. And Phil, the extrovert, who needs plenty of time to play and to have fun. And we were raised in entirely different families. My family's highest values would have been cleanliness, their motto would have been a family that works together, stays together. Yeah. Phil's family's motto would have been, or Phil's motto for his yeah. family would be the family that plays together, <laughs> stays together. Where are my people out here? Yeah. Look at that. And so, and so as you can imagine, we have had a steep learning curve in order to sat satisfy both of us. Because that's what we're called to do, is to satisfy each other. Phil, learning why a clean garage is, gives me such a rush when I pull into that garage. You know that feeling? It's just so perfect. Have you ever vacuumed yourself out of the house? Or am I the only weird person, OCD person here? And my grasping has immense need for fun to energize him. I don't need to have fun. It's such a waste of time. <laughs> Even while we were preparing this message, Phil prayed, grabbed my hand and prayed, and he said, God, help us to have fun while we prepare this message. And I'm thinking, fun? Who cares about fun? We just need to get this done. But the Lord, he's so gracious, isn't he? He'd think that he would just condemn me for those kind of rigid way of thinking. But the Lord just kept bringing Phil's words back to my heart. And I kept hearing God say he needs to have fun, Di. This is not extracurricular. It's the way I made him. Get that serious frown off your face and lighten it up. Make this fun for Phil. We are learning that in order for us to live happily even after, we need to be creating a place in which both of us can thrive. And we take on that task for each other. There's joy in that. I promote Phil's need for fun and even try to be fun every once in a while. I crack a joke, maybe a real joke, maybe once or twice a year. Yes, and you, ne and you never know how hilarious you were, but whatever. You, yes, yes. And Phil protects my need to be alone, enough to fill up, to think, and at least tries to understand my obsessive need for order. And here's what I have learned. Women marry men hoping that we can change them, right? Just, you know, clean them up, quiet them down, just a few tweaks here and there, get them to see the world my way. And men marry women hoping they will never, ever change. <laughs> that they'll stay that sweet, compliant, skinny woman that they married. <laughs> right, Phil? Right, Phil? <laughs> I am not going to answer that. <laughs> if you want to live happily ever, even after, if you want to have healthy relationships, practice love and respect, appreciate each other's differences, and finally, and we'll be done in a bit here, stay best friends. Stay best friends. When God created Adam, he created the world and said it is good. When he created Adam, he said it's not good that man should be alone. I will create a helper suitable to him. In Hebrew, kenego ezer is a fascinating term. Uh, and, and Eve was a gift to Adam. Notice God didn't say, well, it's not good for Adam to be alone, so I'm going to create three dudes to go have a drink with and watch the Seattle Seahawks <laughs> beat the 49ers. No. <laughs> That wasn't his deepest need. He created Eve, his Eve. And there's a line in the Song of Solomon, which is a beautiful little book after Proverbs. I love to read Proverbs every day. Today I read Proverbs 5. And, and then there's Ecclesiastes under the Song of Solomon. And it's, it's a picture between us and God and his love, but it's also a romantic picture of the way God created male and female to enjoy being married together. And there's a line in there, this my lover, this my friend. 
And I love that because your spouse is to be your one and only lover, but you also should be best friends. And that's going to take some work as we've been being transparent with you today, keeping current, as some people say, asking forgiveness quickly, being willing to humble yourself and be one who serves instead of serving yourself, which, by the way, is what Jesus did. He said, the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom of many. When we start serving each other, it should almost be, well, let me serve you. Well, I want to serve you. Well, let me serve you. You're going to have a much more beautiful, beautiful marriage. Our youngest son, Matthew, they just had their first babies, four months old, and we, uh, we Diane just got to be there for a couple days. They live in Portland, and when they were on their honeymoon, we had enough airline miles to give them a gift to go someplace international, and they picked Bali. I've never been to Bali, but it's, you know, super exotic, and so they're on their honeymoon, and Matthew Instagrams, I married my best friend, and I thought, well, that's nice. <laughs> you know, I mean, you better be able to say that on your honeymoon, <laughs> or you should not be getting married. <laughs> the challenge is to stay best friends. And that's going to take the kind of things we've been talking about today. And it's going to take Jesus in the center of your life. Jesus in the center of your marriage. And Jesus, who else is worthy? We sang it. No one else is worthy. He's the one that can give you all that you need. And so let's stay best friends and let's be kind to one another. Let's be friendly toward each other. And this goes both ways. I mean, wives are more tender and kind generally, but for us men, we need to be tender and kind and friendly as well. I heard a guy say one time, nobody wants to cuddle a porcupine, right? No, you want to be warm. And so every year, we save up money to go back to where we had our honeymoon in Carmel, California. Some of you perhaps have been there. We grew up and met in, in what's called Silicon Valley, and it's only like an hour and five minute drive to Carmel, so we would go there on our day off, but we had our honeymoon there. We have a lot of romantic memories. It's over the Pacific Ocean, and so we save up our money every year, and we go there, and it's getting more and more expensive, so we're saving more. <laughs> but the reason we go is because we don't want to say we were once best friends on our honeymoon or three years in or after the first kid, you know, we want to say we still are best friends and we're going to continue to cultivate this relationship because it's an amazing gift from God. So this week, in your marriage, in your friendships, in your family, practice love and respect. Appreciate each other's differences and stay in good relationships. Be friendly with those that God's brought closest to you and God will bless you in a powerful way. Amen? Let me close by praying for you, and then your pastor is going to come up in just a moment. But would you close your eyes? And if you're married, take the hand of your spouse. And if taking their hand is a little awkward because you're not in a good spot, if you can do it, do it anyway. Even if in your heart you're saying, Lord, we need help. And if you're in a good place, as Tyler already led us, let's just take some time to thank the Lord. Yeah. Jesus is our example of all these things. We want to know what love looks like. We just look at him. 1 John 4 says God is love. We love because he first loved us. In Romans, it says that Jesus has fully accepted us. How dare we go and then not accept one another? And you know what? He calls you his friend. In John 15, no longer do I call you servants, but I've called you friends as you do what I command you. Lord, we thank you that you are our example. May the Spirit of God and the love of Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit flow through us in all of our relationships, especially in marriages this week. In Jesus' name, amen.